this webinar um, is actually really timely for, for cover crops um, from Marisol Berti. And um, if you haven't listened to Marisol talk about cover crops before, she is a wealth of information and my go-to person for pretty much anything research related or practical applications, equipment, um, I mean, all that kind of stuff there. You just have a lot of experience, Marisol. So thank you for, for sharing that with us. And um, what we'll do is we'll just play a pre-recorded uh, webinar and then Marisol and I will be over in the um, chat box and we can answer questions as you have them as we go through the presentation. Uh, this is a series of webinars that's been sponsored by the North Central uh, Sustainable Agriculture and Research and Education. And so we're, uh, we're putting some, uh, some of these webinars that they used to be live uh, presentations uh, in this format. And so I'll go through the presentation and uh, this link will be available for you and then you can send questions later. Okay, so uh, I am Mary Solverti and a professor in the Department of Plant Sciences and main campus in Fargo, North Dakota State University. And I work on cover crops, forage crops and uh, cropping systems. So this presentation um, is a compilation of some information from the research on how to select a cover crop according to the cropping system, so to your cropping system. <clears throat> so the first thing you need to do if you're gonna do cover crops or you're really, and you know if you're really doing some is to learn some more about cover crops, right? To know what their family belong to, what root system they have, are they winter hardy or not, are they warm or cool seasons, or what function do they perform in the ecosystem. Uh, become familiar and learn. Uh, these webinars is a way to learn some of the things uh, because to make the decision of what to plant on your cropping system, uh, you need to understand certain things about these cover crops. So cover crop classification, we can classify them by family, botanical family, legumes, cereals, brassicas, and other families, by the seasonal cycle, cool season or warm seasons, that's very important and by ecosystem function. These are the functions that these dif different cover crops and different families do. And it's gonna be related to the objectives of why or what you want the cover crops for, and I'll show that later. Uh, so the cover crops most important families are the grasses, in which you know most of the crop, right? The cereals, right? Winter wheat, barley, oats, triticale, forest sorghum, also millet, brassicas, radish, turnips, canola, and legumes, okay? And so we have much more legumes than these ones, but crimson clover, winter pea, there's fava bean, there's many others. Now root system is something very important because uh, root systems uh, do different things in the soil. We're interested in soil health. And so each types of family have different things that contribute to the soil. So the root system, uh, we have a fibrous system, which is typical of the um, of the cereals. Like here, you can see you can see a rye um, a rye uh, root, and it has a lot of the soil attached to it. Well, if you look at a at a, a radish or turnip on the on the right side, left side. Uh, you can see that there's no soil attached. And this is because cereals, um, they have, uh, they have uh, association with mycorrhizal fungi, which produce some glue-like substances that make the soil to glue to that root and also uh, improve soil aggregation. The root on the top is from an alfalfa root, and you can see those are fat, uh, those are roots, they have nodules, nodules, uh, that in symbiotic association with the plant, fix atmospheric nitrogen, so they put nitrogen into the soil. So it's important to see that, and you can see the roots of the brassicas, turnips and radish, don't have soil attached, and it's because plants in this family are not mycorrhizal. Seasonal cycle is very important because it's gonna depend uh, when you can plant or cannot plant these crops depend on your objective. Warm seasons, we have forage, sorghum, millet, teff, cowpea, of course, corn, soybean, those are warm seasons. Uh, and, and warm seasons are crops that require temperature, so they cannot be planted too early in the season, and they are freeze 
as soon as the temperature reaches 32 uh, Fahrenheit in the fall. Cool seasons, you know them, cereals, uh, there's a lot of legumes and brassicas. Um, all the ones we use are all cool seasons. I don't know of any warm season brassica. Important to know them um, to see where you're gonna feed them on your, um, on your cropping system. So your cropping system and the questions on this cropping system is very important, right? What is your crop rotation? If you ask someone, well, what cover crops should I use? We need to know what crop you have before the cover crops and what crop is following your cover crops. The reason for this and why is this important is because residual herbicides, right? We need to know what crop you had before you're gonna plant cover crops and know where's your herbicide uh, program because if you have a residual herbicide, likely you might kill all your cover crops. So you need to know that. And I'm not gonna talk much about that, but Dr. Mike Osley in the Carrington uh, Research Ex Extension Center, he did a webinar last week and it's available online at that uh, link. And uh, this will be available for you to see. And he did a presentation on herbicide residues and cover crops, what cover crops you can plant or not on herbicides used in corn and soybean. Then the other thing is important to know what cover crop you, uh, cover crops or crop you have before and after is the seeding date, right? Because if you have a cereal uh, before your cover crop, you have a lot more time to drill one. But if you have corn, you don't have that. Competition for water is important because um, some cover crops can drain the soil from water and some certain toxicities some crops can produce through allelopathy to each other. <clears throat> Seeding dates is extremely important uh, the time you plant. And I wanna show this is um, some data. Every year we do this experiment just to show in, in the farmers the ability of the plants to grow planted with only two weeks difference. You see these, these were planted on July 27 and August 10, okay? I'm just showing the July 27, the blue lines for plants on the grasses, plants on the brassicas, and plants on the legumes. Okay, so um, I don't think I have an arrow. All right, so well, the important thing is this graph that I have here is um, you see uh, have, I have the different families, grasses, brassicas, legumes. But within one of these ones, we have warm seasons, right? And cool season, like forest sorghum, fox and millets are warm, and these ones are cool seasons. So if now I go uh, ahead and I put the second date, you can see this is the biomass produced from planting right until the frost came on these crops. And you can see as forest sorghum on only that difference between planting, you know, it's about, it's not even 15 days. Uh, the biomass production of a crop decreased on 77%. Okay, so that's the impact of the seeding date and the, and the late summer and early fall. And this is why it's important if you're planting a, a cover crop for fall grazing, you really don't want uh, sorghum or millet because you're gonna produce very little and I'll show you some pictures. And brassicas, even at the cool seasons, you also lose growth. Because for every day that you lose in August, you get less temperatures, you still lose the opportunity of growth. Uh, even these plants are not going to uh, get frosted right away, like sorghum, they're still gonna produce a lot less the later you plant them. But these are plants that you can plant in the fall, but you have to know that the sooner you plant right after the harvest of your cereal crop, uh, the more yield you're gonna have. Now you look here at the winter cereals, you can see that rye, for example, had actually higher yield on the second date, okay? Because it's a cool season. And the same with legumes, you can see 4-HP still reduce it, but not as much as, uh, as the brassicas. And the hairy veg actually increased uh, in yield on the second day. So this is key for uh, selecting a cover crop or a cover crop mix, especially when you're in the fall. This is for fall seeding, right after a cereal crop. So here are some of the pictures from that graph, right? This is how much this sort of forest sorghum grew 
when planted at the end of July, this is how much it grew, right? This is a weed. Huh? This is the important one. You see, there's almost nothing. There's no cover. Uh, doesn't even help with soil erosion here, let, let alone for grazing or anything. You're not getting any biomass by planting in August 10. You know, it's not. Uh, so this is a uh, picture show that in Fox and Mill is same thing. You see planted at the end of July versus planted August 10. Look, there's almost nothing. You know, that dry stuff, these pictures were taken after the frost. So you can see this, this frost is the grass that is there, that's the, the grass. Well, pictures taken, all these pictures were taken at the same time. Um, for sure, you don't, almost don't see a difference. And Sarah Rye, right, you see some difference, but it's mainly because Sarah Rye is a winter crop and, and when you plant it too early, it tends to try to bolt, even if it doesn't, try to uh, head, so it gets a little taller. Uh, while you plant it later, it just, just behaves as a winter. You know, it's just a winter crop, so it's not going to produce tall biomass like oats. But the differences, as you saw in the graphic before, are not as much, but these differences are striking, right? You got 14 days of difference and you almost don't get any biomass. And the brassicas, you saw the graph too, their differences, right? Between one planted in July, one planted in August. Although these plants didn't freeze, you see this picture was taken after frost and you see sorghum and miller are, are frozen, um, have been frozen, but these ones are still alive. But we have a difference, you can see in most of the, the brassicas, the one plant in July bolted and flower, you know, and flower and it has, uh, while this one looks, uh, it hasn't flowered yet. So there is a difference in that. And there is a difference in root growth, and that's what we're interested, right? We're trying to work on soil health. Uh, brassicas are used for uh, reducing compaction or, um, you know, uh, moving nutrients that, uh, up from, tapping nutrients from deep in the soil up, up. And you can see in this case that this, you know, when you plant it a lot earlier, you have a huge root. So this root likely go, is going deeper than this root planted two weeks later. The same uh, turnips and then with radishes, you see you got a turnip here, turnip here, and then you have a, a radish here, radish here. You don't see as much different, but in turnip you can see the huge difference. So you have less above ground biomass uh, by planting two weeks later, but also you have less root mass, which is what we are interested. So, Objectives are very important. Um, everyone that asks me or ask any of the researchers or extension people is what cover crop should I use? The first thing we're gonna ask you is where are your objectives? What do you want the co cover crop for? Okay, what do you expect from the cover crop? What, why do you want it for? What, why do you want to have cover crops? And one, what do you want that cover crop to do for your soil, for your farm, for your operation, and your next crop? So you have to have certain objectives in mind so we can help you and guide you. We're not gonna give you a recipe of what it is. We're gonna, it's just like in these presentations, we're gonna tell you what are the alternatives that you can choose from. So crop sequence is gonna be very important, right? And especially because of the timing that you're gonna have to plant or not plant. So, uh, in North Dakota, in many parts, we have a wheat or a cereal, could be barley or oats, followed by soybean the following year, right? And that's just gonna be one of the common sequences and I'll show what, what possibilities of crops you have there. Then we have one that's corn to soybean where things are a lot more complicated or soybean to soybean or soybean to corn, right? For people that grow corn soybean rotation, how we insert these cover crops into those mixtures. Then we have a cereal sugar beet, which is another rotation. Usually sugar beet in the Red River Valley is followed by uh, after wheat. And so we want to see what options we have there or in season. And then we have fall season uh, grazing. That means it's called fall season grazing of cover crops are really their annual forages, that's what they are. And there's been a lot of use of these because of the preventive planted acres. So you can put some of these uh, forages and graze it later. Last year, because of the conditions that were so wet, uh, the, the, the deadline to be able to graze this was moved to September 1st, so a lot of farmers were able to graze it. Um, each year uh, is on November 1st, 
unless uh, they change it. So we'll see what happens this year, they're gonna change it. And for fall grazing, usually of something planted after, uh, cereal is where you're gonna have different alternatives. So I made these diagrams in a little bit to try to simplify the different sequences and what you're gonna do about them. So from cereal to soybean or corn, you kind of want to keep it, uh, especially from cereal to soybean, you want to keep it simple and cheap, right? Especially if you're not going to graze it, all your interest is soil health, keep it as simple and cheap as you can, okay? Um, one, this is not the only one, but winter rye is very in, important to have in the mix when you have soybean as the next crop, because if it's too wet in the spring, you need something to dry up the water so you can plant the soybean. Radish and flax are gonna get winter kill, but they have another uses. So if I have wheat, I have time to drill. Drill is always better than aerial seeding or broadcasting on the surface. So if you have the time to drill, you drill. Um, those red, uh, red uh, shapes I have in there is just to show that if you don't have this, if you don't have these cover crops in the fall, you're gonna have losses of nitrates and phosphorus by runoff. While if you put those cover crops on top, then this is going to disappear, right? Whatever cover crop you have growing in August through November, it's gonna avoid the losses of nitrogen and phosphorus in some erosion. But in the spring is when we get, when we are not wet, and when in the spring we get a dry spell, soils are not protected or covered by a cover crop, growing cover crop, uh, they have a lot of erosion. And then if it rains, we have also nitrate and phosphorus losses. So we don't want that. So in this case, if we plant the winter rye, winter rye will survive the winter and will provide that cover. So these problems will disappear and we will be able to plant our soil. Um, so some pictures here uh, of a, a cereal and then soybean. So this is winter rye that was planted last fall um, after a cereal, or it could be after soybean if you have time. And then this soybean was planted onto green rye, okay? Rye, you can terminate it uh, before planting, or you can plant when it's green and then terminate it with Roundup, okay? Um, green planting takes a little more knowledge how to do it, but it works especially on wet uh, springs. Uh, because rye helps to dry the soil so you can get the soybeans earlier in the season. Now, you have to watch this, that, this uh, system because if you're in a sandy soil, uh, you actually uh, could get too much water out by the rye and cause a problem, and we've seen that. On dry years, uh, a crop like rye will dry the soil enough that it could cause a yield loss on your crop. So you have to watch for that. Mm -hmm. So soybean to soybean is the same thing. Some people are doing soybean to soybean. Like you, you can see here, this crop is still standing. It was aerially seeded with rye. You can see rye in, the, in between the rows. Soybean hasn't been harvested yet, but that rye is gonna provide a protection to the soil and to the nutrients not to be lost uh, by erosion or by, uh, by leaching. And once that soybean is harvested, then you're gonna have that green cover. Okay, so aerial seeding uh, can be done uh, uh, right before leaf drop or somewhere in there, but I'll show my more information about that. So this crop is a winter rye, is winter crop, will survive until next spring and you can plant soybean again. And there are some people doing that. They're planting, they put in an aerial seeded rye into standing soybean and next year they plant soybean again. And here you can see the same thing. So, um, cereal to corn, what is important is when you are doing cereal to corn, that means you, if you, you cannot really use uh, rye. The same as you're going to wheat because uh, some people use it still rye before corn, but uh, corn is very susceptible to rye for the different reasons. It could be nitri nitrogen tie up or it could be um, could be water problems, it could be allelopathy or toxins. 
So the recommendation, the best recommendation, if you have wheat this year, next year you're going to corn or wheat again, is don't have rye on your system and just have crops that winter kill. Like this is a barley flax rape. So this was planted after a cereal crop. And this is a radish flax turnip fava bean bio strips. I mean, it's a planting by strips. So the farmer next year is going to plant the corn where this strip is. Okay, so that's what's called by a strip. It's gonna, in that area where these radishes are, are concentrated and nutrients are picking up from deep in the soil, now the farmer's gonna plant it there. Now the corn to soybean, and it's a common sequence, uh, is complicated because corn is too late. In some years, like last year, we didn't even get it, right? There's still a lot of fields with corn. Um, and, uh, and so you can't really plant a cover crop after corn harvest because most years you're not gonna have a season after corn harvest. So here's where a lot of the work on interseeding has been done. Uh, interseeding or aerial seeding, it can be a cereal rye if you're gonna follow it with soybean, or if you're gonna follow with wheat or, or corn again, then you don't want cereal rye, you just want barley or radish, okay? So interseeding can be done at the V6 stage. There's equipment developed, I'll show pictures, to do that and we've done a lot of work trying to figure out how to do this and what works and what doesn't and then the other possibility is aerial seeding or broadcasting um, with in the R4 R6 I mean late in the season okay in September October we really don't have time because the corn is still going to be there um, so the idea of this interseeding aerial seeding and standing corn is to establish a cover crop while growing corn. So when I take the corn off, then this crop is already there, okay? If I don't put anything, I'm gonna have losses of nitrate and phosphorus in the soil, because I don't have any green cover taking them up. Even I have corn residue, I don't have a green cover, uh, roots, green roots moving the nutrients. So if I put radish in a cereal, then I'm gonna get rid of that. And then next spring, I'm gonna have uh, a living crop, like rye, if it's a winter crop, and then I go to soybean. So here's some pictures of what we did in our project, and, and this is a larger, it was a 100 acre field that it was interseeded with a special equipment was developed for that, which is this one. And that one uh, is a um, twin row, uh, separated six inches on the 30 inch center rows that uh, can plant plant those two rows of cover crops. I'll show more pictures. Also, you can use some of these heavy sprayers modify for seeds, and it works. This this one works, but the the disadvantage of this system is the seed is just placed in the soil. There's no incorporation. There's no really planting. It's a I would I would call it a inline or in row um, broadcasting. It's better than aerial because the seeds don't get caught on the crop, they go directly to the soil, but they're still on top of the surface. And these systems, they're broadcasting or aerial, have the, the disadvantage of that you cannot use cover crops with large seed. You couldn't use, you couldn't do peas, you couldn't do fava beans, soybeans, no, nothing with a large seed can be done on these systems. While with the, this interseeder, this is a planter, so you can put any size crop. Is your planting. Uh, here you see some uh, different plants that we've tried. We've tried different, all different species to see what grows. Now the canopy under the corn, it has only like 15% of light. And at some times of the year, it's 10% of light. So when you're putting this at V6, the plant is already about, you know, taking 70% of the light. So it's only 30% left. By the time these plants start coming out of the soil, there's almost no light. So you see they grow really kind of spindly uh, for the lack of, of uh, light, okay? And then later in the season, you see this here. Now, the idea is that when you harvest these, these plants are gonna get light and be able to grow. But what we observe that is there is a huge difference on shade tolerance on these plants, okay? Uh, some plants can tolerate these being a couple months without light, uh, but some don't do very good. This is another um, planting within about 100 acres. Um, this is winter rye 
with radish in the season. This is what it was planted with that equipment I showed before, uh, the twin row cedar, right? You can see that uh, the rye and the radish, that they look spindly and, and yellow. And this one had camelina too. And uh, you can see camelina on this other one. And then when this was, the corn, this corn was harvested, this is what it looked. And we were really happy. This was in 2016. You see, you see there's rye, there's radish. You could graze this. There's a lot of forest there together with the fiber of the corn. And so we're happy to see this, but this doesn't happen every year. Like last year, this wouldn't happen because the corn was never off. So the cover crops, even if they were there, they never got a chance to grow. Okay. Um, and then in the winter, this, this is what you want to see because you could still graze cattle in the winter and get all that green stuff that is in there, right? But we wish, this is what we would want every year, but this in corn doesn't happen every year. There's so many years where corn gets really late, like last year, and we don't get to harvest it, so cover crops are not going to grow very well. Um, so even to soybean, it's a similar story, except that you have a little more time than in corn. Usually it comes off a couple of weeks before. You can do interseed in a V6, but I'll show you really all the work we've done. When you interseed in soybean too early, the, all the crops under the canopy die. And the reason is in soybean, even it's a lot shorter crop, but it's a broad leaf. So because it's a broad leaf, there's no light going through the canopy. So there's barely 5% of light under the canopy. It's very dark in there. We just don't go under the canopy, so we don't know, but there's no light for a crop to grow. So what we've tried and what really has worked is more of a aerial seeding, a leaf drop or broadcasting, where the, the cover crop is not subjected to a really long period of shade. Of shade. Also, all these interseeding systems um, and you know, rainfall we're rain-fed systems, so the success that we get on doing this depends on, on rainfall. If we plant this here, and we get a nice rainfall, all those cover crops are gonna come. If you plant here and there's two weeks with no rainfall, we're not gonna lose it. Or sometimes we get some rainfall, but it's so little that the plant germinate and then they die. So uh, we're so dependent on rainfall because it's a broadcaster. That's what's, the idea of doing this V6, right? Because we can put it on the soil, that in soybean really doesn't work. So the same concept, if you are able to put something interseeded ahead, by the time you harvest the soybean, you're already gonna have a crop there. Um, and, and in soybean, if you use an early maturing variety, you might even be able to dry, uh, to drill the rye right after the soybean, okay? And if you do that, uh, then you can have a crop and so rye can be planted later, it can be planted in September. <coughs> so um, if you have a winter rye, you're gonna have a rye come back in the spring and take the moisture and uh, nutrients that we should lose. And I also wanna show you, you can do this also with winter camelina because it's also very winter hardy. And here you see this been broadcasted over in soybean, standing soybean is already there. So when I have a soybean, I got a green cover, right? A green cover. And then next year I'll plant soybeans and I'll show you some, a different system that we have, what we call a relay cropping, where we actually, next year, we uh, plant the soybeans into the green camelina before a bolt uh, in the spring. And then the soybean starts growing while the camelina is still in there. Then camelina is an oil seed uh, of very high quality. So you could get that crop and, and make some money if we have a market. We don't really have a good market yet, but it's a good possibility because then you get two crops. Once you have as a camelina, then the soybean keeps uh, growing. And here I wanna show you there's a farmer um, in North Dakota that actually did this. So, um, and so he, he had soybean last year, he harvested the soybean and drilled this uh, winter camelina. This is a 74 acre field. Uh, he planted the camelina in the fall with a twin row cedar. And in the spring, when camelina was still very short, he planted with a twin row, planted again, twin rows of soybean in between. 
Okay, it's hard to see here the rose, and this is a flowering time. Then when the Carolina dries and ready to harvest, you can see there uh, the row of soybean that's growing under, right? And I took this picture right before the farmer harvested. And when the farmer harvested that, then uh, the Carolina is then harvested and then the soybean gets to grow and produce grain. So you get, that's why it's called relay cropping because you get two crops in the season, okay? You get the, the, the now the farmer had a, uh, uh, he adapted his, um, his uh, harvester, so it had like a, a piece of tile drain, a plastic, where the soybean rows were to avoid cutting too much green foliage of the soybean when he was harvesting canalina. <clears throat> the yields, um, the yields of the soybean were about 75% of would have been if you would have soybean alone. So you will have a yield rack, but then, then you have camelina too. So if camelina can have a good price, then you have two crops. Okay, moving on. Um, like I said, we've done a lot of things with interseeding uh, cold crops into soybean in R6. Uh, and here you see camelina again. We're doing some work on camelina as, as reducing the soybean seed nematode. Um, in the greenhouse, we've seen that camelina can reduce the soybean seed nematode, but when we did this in the field, it was very hard to get response because of the variability. But this is what, when you harvest, and here we try different crops, we try peas. You see here the peas are super uh, damaged by, by the shade, uh, but when the, variety was of soybean was harvested and you see these peas in the row here okay so it is possible to do it um but uh, you have to have an, an early maturing variety so it lets the cover crop to have light as soon as possible and like i said before this works better in r6 than d6 or r4 <coughs> so this is what I was saying, right? If we have cover crops now for soybean to corn or wheat, I mentioned the corn. They may, this is about the same as we mentioned before. You could have an interseeding, but we don't really recommend the V6, V8. We've seen in soybean doesn't work. We can do an aerial seeding or we can do, uh, go the other way. Or we can, uh, uh, but in this case, we want to have crops that the winter kill like barley and radish, or you can use winter camelina. Winter camelina does not have the problems that rye has before wheat and corn. You don't want to have a rye before wheat because of contamination. If you get some plants to go to head, you're going to have your wheat contaminated with rye seeds. And in corn, there's some allelopathy, and wheat, there is some too. So you, if you have rye before wheat, you might have a reduction in yield. But at least if you have cover crops that get winter kill, like the little picture says there, you have a cover in the soil, okay, that are in the spring. That are, it's not gonna move water if it's too wet, but at least it's gonna protect it from soil erosion. <clears throat> so all this research on interseeding, uh, if we do a summary, really the successful establishment with interseeding or aerial seeding really depends largely on rainfall. If you get a nice rainfall after you interseed, or aerially seed, then you get a cover crop. If you don't get rain for two weeks, you don't get a cover crop and waste your seed. Now, in the real one interseeded, you get a better chance because you got a soil to seed contact of getting established. But if you seed too early, then the shade can kill your cover crops. Now, cover crops have different tolerance to shade. Of the ones we've used on the experiment, cereal rye is the one that has the most tolerance to shade. And then, uh, oat and barley, and then red clover, hay ridge. Pea and fabian have horrible tolerance to shade, and brassicas don't do well at all, okay? Depends the year, you, you got really good moisture, but uh, radish, turnips don't do very well in shade. So if you wanna drill them uh, after the crop, that's when you wanna use them. But interceding, when we started this project, we, we thought interceding was a much better solution, but um, we didn't realize that the competition uh, for light is, is too great, so it really hasn't worked too much. Now, with the interest on 60-inch corn, 
there's a lot of people are gonna start doing this now. And in six inch corn, now you're gonna have light. So it's gonna be a completely different system. And that'll be interesting to see what happens with that. Interseeding in soybean, it has to be very late because early doesn't work at all. And corn works something. Another work that um, my colleagues did, I, uh, I'm part of this project, but um, I didn't do it. Um, Dr. Chatterjee in soy fertility, he's working in sugar beet in, uh, in cover crops in sugar beet. Uh, this is uh, some of slides from his students, Silesh. Um, and the concept here was uh, a little bit different than the other cover crops. In, in sugar beet, uh, since we're not producing grain, the green foliage of the cover crop is not going to cause a problem with harvest. But in sugar beet is a crop where we have tremendous soil erosion in the spring and in the fall because when the harvester takes the roots and then the soil still does nothing to hold the soil. And also we have problems with nitrate, a lot of leaching nitrates. Uh, sugar beets are fertilized with high amounts of nitrates and the problem is when this nitrate moves too deep in the soil, it actually produces a reduction in sugar content if the plant has too much nitrogen. So <clears throat> here the cover crops have a little bit of a different objective other than soil erosion and nutrient losses. Actually taking up some of that excess nitrate can help the uh, sugar beet quality. And so the, the, the questions really were, uh, can we intercede these crops? We try different crops. And when we intercede these crops, can we uh, do this to protect the soil without compromising yield, right? We don't want to reduce sugar beet yield or quality. And so we don't know. This is something I think uh, uh, we're the first one and, and the issue uh, Dr. Charity start this type of research to see if this is something we could do. It's, it was a very interesting research. We tried rye, winter camelina, winter shrimp, mustard, interceded at two different uh, planting dates, and this has been done two years in a row. Uh, one in June and one in July, those are the same dates and those years. The results are changing every year, but this picture shows you the interest of what, what we really want to do. This is what the soil looks like after we harvest the sugar beet and we don't have a cover crop growing in the spring. This picture was taken in the spring. You see where this rye was planted last year in between the, there's still, even the harvester went through, the middle of the row was not disturbed. So uh, you still have that rye in there. So that rye is holding into the soil. Mm -hmm. Somebody said, well, how am I gonna plant on that, right? <laughs> That's gonna be a problem, but there's a lot of things we, we have to deal with, but uh, having that crop there, you're reducing soil erosion and you're moving water out of the soil for whatever next crop it is. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so the results show that uh, by interceding these cover crops, right, um, each one, the, the, the biomass yield here, this is the biomass yield of the cover crops. So rye has the most biomass uh, yield in the fall, in the spring. Okay, and camelina has the least, and we know that camelina is a forms of rosette, produce very little foliage, but it produces cover, kind of grows sideways. And then these are the June and July uh, biomass yield, right? So there was an effect of date across all the species. Of course, those interceded later produce less biomass. Now, what was interesting on this was what happened with uh, root yield and quality. The, uh, in 2018, actually the highest yield, significantly higher than the, con than the control here, than at least two of the other cover crops, was you see mustard uh, had a higher value. Although if you look at the letters, they're not quite, they're not really significant. But you can see that at least we didn't get a loss on yield by having these cover crops in between. What is really interesting is the sugar content. Uh, the crop significantly, although you see here the difference and not too much, but, but in sugar, in sugar, the sugar content, only 1% of increase in sugar content can signify about $80 per ton, you know, $80 per acre of gaining. So a 1% difference is significant in sugar beet. 
we didn't get quite one percent difference, but you can see the highest sugar content on these and significantly different than control were on those they had uh, cover crops. In it. Okay, and so what we're thinking is happening, uh, we're moving some of the nitrogen away from the sugar beet and uh, nitrate, excess nitrate reduces the sugar content. So we're moving it away. Now the year after this, uh, the student did this again, and uh, the results were different, especially well, 2019, everyone knows it was a very difficult season, very unusually cold. And uh, here what happened is the cover crops actually did reduce yield, okay? Not all of them, but uh, especially those planted in June reduced root yield compared to the control significantly. Um, the conditions weren't there, so the crops actually grew faster than the sugar beet did, and so they caused root yield. Now when they was planted in July, actually the one with cover crops had a uh, slightly higher, although not significant than the control uh, yield. So in July, they didn't cause as much problem, but it went planted in June, it did cause reduction, and we don't wanna see that. And, uh, <clears throat> and the sugar content, we couldn't observe the same exact responses last year, although there was a trend to show something similar that the, the roots with cover crops where we have cover crops, these have a higher sugar content. Although statistically, because of the variation wasn't significant, we could see there were some interesting things. But when we have a crop like planted in July, actually it was a lot lower. Now, one thing that could happen too, you have lower yield, right? We had that, where, where we had a winter right, we also had lower yield. When you have lower yield, you tend to concentrate sugar in the roots. So it might be just a concentration uh, result. So the summary is, and they're gonna do this this year again, okay, because it's an interesting thing um, to do because we can get a cover in the soil and then if we don't reduce yield and can re increase sugar, that's, that would be very uh, important. So interseeding um, and selection of species in, is, you see there's difference depend what crops you have. I know this year they're gonna change some of the crops. I think they're gonna put flax, they're gonna put some, some other ones. They're, they're trying different things. Uh, early planting has very cover crop stem, but also you, in some years you could reduce root yield. Uh, the, the protection from the erosion, especially on the next spring, if you have a winter crop, is, uh, is very interesting and it's something that it would be very good for sugar growers. And uh, that uh, scavenging of nitrate, excess nitrate, uh, nitrate leading to increase of sugar content is, is a very important result. And if they, this can happen, it's something that people might want to do because that's actually economical if you can increase your sugar content in 1%. So rye can be effective for control. And now, well, this was, has been done only in small plots and uh, some farmers are interested in trying a large acreage and see if they can protect their soil from erosion. And then grazing, um, grazing, I'm really interested in that, I work in forages. I think cover crops uh, provide a nutritious, uh, you know, forage, especially in mixes. Now, how to do these mixes depends on pretty much when you're planting, when you're doing, and what are you doing, okay? Uh, it's very variable and depends uh, on the farmer, the type of animal, what are you doing? So. Before I go into this, I wanted to show just this graph to show you, and this is for any forage, whether it's a mix, whatever. Uh, as the dry matter yield of a forage goes up, that means as it matures, right, the quality goes up. And that's for any plant, okay? The, the more mature the plant, the less the forage quality is going to be. And this is gonna have, uh, this is gonna work when, and the mix is the same thing, okay? So what is forage quality or nutritive value? It really is not depending on the composition of the plant so much, but in the animal performance. So that's my cow, can, can my cow increase in weight if I feed them this or that forage? So there's different things that you're gonna hear when, when you talk about um, these annual forages or cover crops for, for um, <clears throat> for grazing, right? And 
there are things that they're going to give you. The, the forage quality depends on nutritive value or voluntary intake. You have to take the intake, right? You can have a, a forage with very, very high nutritive value. The cow doesn't like it, doesn't eat it. You know, it doesn't work, right? So we have the chemical compositions are important, um, the types of the fiber, the different components here, fiber, protein. Protein is not the only thing that's important in quality of forages. Uh, digestibility or, or energy content that we usually translate in something called total digestible nutrients and other things. Retention time, so we have a, a forage that has so much water and very highly digestible like the brassicas, it goes through the room and the system so fast that it, the nutrients are not useful. Yeah, they don't, they're not used. Accessibility and acceptability are important, right? <clears throat> so the, co the cover crops or forage you're gonna use have to do a little bit with the animal requirements. And I'll show you very general, um, for a, it changes with the type of animal. For a 1200 uh, uh, pound cow with a calf, these are, more or less the pounds of forage consumed per day and pounds of forage consumed per month. And then in the graphs, it shows the protein, right? We're about 3% uh, percent protein, three pounds, no percent, three pounds of crude protein per day, right? If a cow consumes 35 pounds of forage a day, that's in each such forage with about 8.5% crude protein. Now for total digestion nutrients, they need 17, pounds per day, and this is all dry matter. Uh, so at 35 pounds per day consumption, you need 48% TDN in the forage, okay? And I want you to remember this when I show you, these are the average uh, crude protein and uh, TDN values for these cover crops that we can grow them alone or we can mix them. If you notice, uh, you remember here, I put them on the side, uh, these are the values that we have from the other slide, right? 8.5 protein and 48 TDN. If you look at these values, and these are things that we grow in North Dakota, uh, the, the usual time that we raise them, and you see everything is higher than that. All the forages are higher than 8.5%, and all the forages are higher than the 48%. So th this means that all these forages, doesn't matter if alone or a mixture, at the raising time, they all meet the requirements of a 1200 pound cow with a calf, which is what most farmers are trying to feed, okay? So um, a lot of people talk a lot about, oh no, I'm gonna add a lot of legumes because I need the quality. If it's beef cattle, you don't need that much more quality. The cover crops, uh, all of them are reaching that. So we did an experiment trying to <clears throat> mix different cover crops mixes with a forest sorghum as a base but also fox and millet and pearl millet. And trying to see, uh, and this is was a little bit for preventive planting, what should we plant if we plant like sometime in June? Okay, what mixes of legume brassicas, warm season, cool seasons? Okay, uh, what, what seeding rates should I use? What's the grazing window? And what happens with the shift in botanical composition? And this is what's really interesting on these uh, crops. So we have, um, 12 different mixtures. Mixtures one through seven were a mix of grasses that you see the different forages or cover crops there. And mixture eight to 12 were a, a, just a monoculture of sorghum, sudan, or forage per millet. And it's 100% one of those. And, um, and here you can see yield. We had two cuts in the summer. This was planted the first week of June, right? And for the different mixtures, and you have them here, uh, you can see that, except for mixture one and two, and I'll explain more about them, all the mixes, no matter how, what crop or how much seed they have, they're not different in yield to the monocultures of sorghum or, uh, they're not different at all, okay? And then in, um, and then the second cut, we had some that produced a little more and they regrew, uh, but they still weren't significantly different. The only one it was different, it was one, which is a annual ryegrass based mixture with chicory, plantain, and red clover. But like someone said, it's, it's like the comparison wasn't fair because really annual ryegrass is a, is a crop that if you are gonna graze it, you should graze it every 15 days, right? So if we would have done that, we probably would have got 
almost as much as the other one. I know the grass keeps growing as you graze it. So if you don't graze it, then it doesn't grow. So we use the same two uh, cuts as for the other one. So it's a fair comparison, unfair comparison. Now the lecture two uh, was more of trying to see for a fall seeded uh, brassica mixture for, so you have only one cut because it's all, it was planted in July, right? It was planted much later for production. But you can see that, uh, the production just planted later was, was uh, uh, over one ton per acre of these brassicas. Now what is interesting on these um, is how the percentages, uh, uh, the percentages of the grasses and the legumes and the brassicas changes with the cut, okay? If you see here in general, in general, in all the mixtures that have sorghum and millet, you'll see that the sorghum and millet, one of them, is dominating the mixture, right? Here, millet is 69%, 12% is the forest sorghum, okay? And the first cut, here forest sorghum is 42%, here is 94%, here 38%. Now, we cut it, and then the second cut, which came uh, at the end of September, we shift to mainly these grasses, right? 59% now the sorghum, now the millet went down. So. Sorghum has the ability of regrow really fast after it's cut, and it takes over most of the mixtures. You see in the, the next one here, another thing that is important to know, because a lot of people like to put legumes into mixtures, is the legumes only survive at the beginning of the, of, for the first cut. After the first cut, the legumes pretty much disappear from the mixture. You see here the red clover, it was low, but then disappeared. Okay, here we didn't have a legume. Here we have pea from 17% of the mixture, went down to zero, fava bean went down to zero. Okay, so um, and if you look in the other mixture, the same thing. Uh, legumes, uh, once they get harvested, they don't have much regrowth power. So you won't have that much of the mix. But you shouldn't worry, right? Because uh, we already, I already showed you that the nutritive value of all these crops is still above of the requirement of cow. Now, uh, the brassicas are the ones that do something the opposite, right? You see here the radish was 6%, now it's 21, right? So brassicas tend to grow more after they've been cut too. So they're gonna, and they like to grow in cool, cooler, sea, cooler season, so they're gonna regrow for the fall. So here is where we're starting to see those plants, and that's why we have this treatment planted in July because these brassicas, they, they did, we put both of them and both of them about half and half of the mixture for the fall. So the, the, this study really shows it, and, and another thing I wanna show you uh, is the rates of sorghum are very, very low, right? Two pounds per acre. Most of the recommendations go about five and even 10. And the problem is if even with this low rate, you're still getting most of the mix of, of sorghum, if you put a lot more, that's all you're gonna get. So you have to give a chance to the other species on your mixture. So you wanna have a diversity of plants in your mixture, you have to reduce your sorghum or millet rate to give a chance to the legumes at least to be there for the first cut, to get a chance for the brassicas to be able to regrow for the second cut. You see in this treatment, Everything pretty much is gone. Uh, even the oats on the second cut is not very good. And, and the second cut, the VMR sorghum took over and it's 80% of the mixture for the second cut. Okay, so um, it, we're gonna repeat that this year and it's, a, it's been an interesting, um, it's the interesting study. So what we learned with this, uh, the forest sorghum melon dominate the mix, even at low rates. Okay, so keep that in mind. Uh, the forage sorghum regrows faster than any of the other cover crops uh, that we evaluated and dominating the mix for fall grazing. Um, forage sorghum yields about the same uh, and mixtures are low. So by putting more mixtures, you're not getting any more than the sorghum alone. So th that's another reason not to put so much seed, right? You're not getting any more uh, by reducing the seed and rate of sorghum. Uh, legumes are usually gone after the first cut, so it's an interesting crop to have there to fix nitrogen, to increase protein, but that's gonna work for the first cut, 
they're gone after that. Uh, brassicas, uh, they're usually gonna tend to increase for fall grazing. So in brassicas are highly digestible. And with the mix of the grasses you have in there, whether it's oats or sorghum or millet, then it's gonna be a very good grazing mixture, okay? So uh, those are the things we learned with this. And, uh, and also the, those mixtures where you don't put a sorghum, especially this, we're talking about full, full season mixtures. If you don't put a sorghum or millet on your mixture, your yield is gonna be a lot lower. So the sorghums and millets are giving the, the bulk of the yield to your mixture, you need forage, right? And they give a lot of the fiber and the other components add to the quality. But if you want yield, you have to have this uh, grow, you know, crops that grow fast in the summer. And so this is a mixture also in a farmer's field, they had uh, some grazing corn and you can see radishes and this one was like a tenway, tenway mixture with those crops in there. Um, this picture was taken right before it was grazing. This has a lot of forage. We calculate had like two and a half tons per acre of forage of dry matter. Uh, you, here you can see what happened with brassicas. Brassicas are really interesting because they're very frost tolerant. And this picture was taken really, really late in the season. They can survive to November and even the cows can graze it and take them out of the snow. And so that's an interesting component for fall or winter grazing. And this cow is pretty happy, you know, was hungry and it's pretty happy. And so thank you for that. And thanks for listening to this present presentation. If you have any questions, uh, you can send me an email and I'll try to answer them. Thanks so much. Uh, that was great. Thank you, Marisol. Um, I'm looking to see if I have two more questions. So first, thanks Scott for handling all the technical stuff. Um, yeah, that's, it's tough with these online webinars to make sure that everything goes very smoothly and we're really lucky to have Scott at NDSU to, to help us with that. Um, so Marisol said she's only available for about 10 questions because she's got to get to the next uh, Zoom meeting at 12.15. So does anybody have any questions for Marisol? And I will ask a question of Marisol. So we've been talking about the standing corn um, 2019 unharvested corn that's out there and, um, and options for that. I know I'm going to fly on some oats and I don't know, Marisol, if you have some other ideas or what you think about how to manage some of the unharvested corn out there using cover crops. Yeah, I, I had a question from a farmer. Um, I think, uh, uh, you know, the problem is not if it's wet and under there with the corn no harvest, it's not going to dry. You won't be able to harvest it. Likely you won't be able to plant anything on that field uh, this year. And um, I think putting a cover crop is a great idea because otherwise the weeds are going to start coming up in between those rows. And so I think flying oats is a great idea. Depends what else you want to do during the summer. Um, you might want to add other crops, like if you are going to, if you have the possibility of grazing, you might want to, uh, even if you get a harvest really late, you might be able to harvest, uh, graze the stubble, and you have some other green stuff in between there. So if you want to, um, if, if you, you think that you might be able to graze it later in the summer or fall, uh, maybe you can add a legume like pea or something like that. I wouldn't spend too much money on it because it's just kind of like a solution, but at least if you have something green going on in there, um, it would be nice to uh, to get something moving water. Now, unfortunately, PC is kind of too big for for flying it and on, but maybe another legume, maybe, uh, I don't like clovers usually, but maybe in this case, you, the clover will, will help a little, you know, to put some nitrogen on that soil. It's a difficult situation. I, I was talking to Abby before, I don't think we never had this problem <laughs> of having to fly cover crops actually in the spring <laughs> on uh, harvested corn, but it is a problem for those that couldn't harvest it. So. Um, let's see, we have another question in here. When talking about cover crops that capture nutrients that could otherwise be lost, how do we estimate the release of those nutrients over the following crop year? That's from your new grad student, Marisol. No, Samuel, thanks for the question. question. That's a really good question, and it's actually one that we've been trying to answer, Dr. Franzen, and, and our project has been done like three years already of research trying to find this. And 
for everything we've seen, um, you can capture quite a bit of nitrogen in the fall, but it's not going to be available for your next crop. That's what we hope, but all the data in not only here in another states in Wisconsin, Matt Barkley, the same, you just don't get the credits for like, if you're gonna plant corn next year. I think it's because our seasons are too short or may maybe just there's not enough time. Uh, Dr. Franson is looking at different reasons why this is happening. Could do too with some uh, immobilization of ammonia into the clay particles. There are different theories, but we are not seeing uh, the nitrogen that you see on the biomass in the fall. You're not seeing it going uh, and be available for the next crop. Gabby, you, you've been working with Dave Franson too, so on that. Yeah, and I, th I think what I've been hearing from farmers too that are pretty intensively using cover crops in their systems is that they don't necessarily see um, the benefit the next year of those cover crops, but it's a couple years down the road, and um, and they're not sure when when they're taking their credits or anything. They're they're slowly backing off on on fertilizer and some of their crops just to see what happens. Um, sorry, I have somebody walking around with a TV show playing on a phone, <laughs> a little guy. <laughs> so if you can hear that, I'm sorry, but. Um, but yeah, I mean, as for now, we're just asking people to leave check strips um, on their field where they where they apply the full rate of nitrogen fertilizer after a cover crop to their next year's cash crop, and then the rest of the field, if they have to come back and add more nitrogen later, then then they can do that. But just have something to at least gauge whether you're seeing a release of nutrients or not, um, depending on the conditions for the year. Yeah, in the research that Matt worked did in uh, Wisconsin, he did show that in, in those in you know in those areas that I apply manure, if you apply manure and put cover crops, you cannot count on those credits either. So if you have manure and cover crops, you can count on that nitrogen credit for the manure. You put cover crops, you don't. So it's the same response. The, the cover crops take it, they help with not getting that nitrate into the water, you know. And so that's a very good thing, right? But it, that's, it comes back to the system much later uh, than we hope and we want it to be. So I have one question to you well from some farmers have been asking me about, say they had a, a diverse cover crop mixed the prior year, you know, with, with say barley in it or something like that. And then they're coming back this year, um, unfortunately, to some of them with another prevent plant situation after this last rain, um, the fields were set up really well with the full season cover crop last year, but but whether, you know, just conditions are bad this year. So um, do they have to worry about any disease transfer between any of that, um, that residue from the prior year's cover crop on PP with, with this year's cover crop, or say they go to something else that may cross-contaminate? Um, I don't know if I'm asking that very clearly, but, but just disease transfer from, from one year's cover crop over to the next year's or to a cash crop. Um, I don't know if you know anything about that or not. I don't. Not much. We we know that from cereals to cereals, you're transferring some uh, fungal diseases in the roots. Um, like, you know, it's one of the problems that rye can cause to corn and it will happen the same if you have rye last year, now you have oats, you could have some diseases moving, root diseases mainly, but that's all I've heard that you have problems. I, I haven't heard of any anything really uh, much of that and I don't think we have much science based data on that. Okay. <laughs> but I know Iowa has a couple research and publications that showing that rye does transfer uh, root diseases to corn from one season to the next. Hmm. All right everyone thanks a lot for hearing and sorry for all that um, for that interference. <laughs> that at least I was hearing, but I, I don't know what happened. And, but thanks, Scott, for helping us with that. And so, sorry, I have an awesome meeting <laughs> in two minutes. So, bye, and thanks for listening to us. You can hear the recording, I think, without interference if you go to the website. Mm -hmm. We have everything posted on ndsu.edu slash soil health with the webinar tab. All these webinars and other ones on grazing cover crops have been posted there and also on the SHIP program. Um, so, so yeah, if anyone has any other questions, let us know. Marisol, thank you for your time. And, um, and we'll see you next Tuesday. Uh, Kevin Sedovic will be doing a grazing uh, webinar on Tuesday. So thanks everyone for joining us. Thank you. Bye.